So, uh, on that note, our first reading comes from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his friend Luke. Please do settle in for the duration. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, hear these words. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to hear, receive, and embody all you reveal to us this day. Amen. We continue this morning in our sermon series on what it means to live in the house of God. We've explored God's extravagant welcome home and God's call for us to invite others to join us in this safe space. We have acknowledged that living together sometimes requires tolerance, and we have heard that the nourishment we receive here readies us to live as Christ's own in the world outside our doors. We have been reminded that in response, we are to be grateful for all that God gives us as good. And then, last week, we wrestled with how we are to handle conflicts that will arise in community. Which brings us to today, the day when we explore that which God gives us that covers over all harms, hurts, insults, grievances, sins. Grace, God's unmerited favor, pure gift we do not deserve or earn or even know we need. It surrounds us, protects us, provides for us, transforms us. <clears throat> it is there for the asking, and even for the unasking. It is what saves us by giving us the faith we need to say over and over every morning, I believe, I receive, I will live for you alone, Jesus. That is what grace is. This is what grace is not. A safety net we hope we never need when we falsely believe we are fully capable of living life or saving ourselves by ourselves without God's ever presence of which we are generally unaware. Grace is not passive or inactive or unrequiring. Grace is also not up to us. It is not created by us, or generated by us, or dreamed up by us. It is all God. 
every bit of God's Trinitarian self given to us first at God's initiative. It should take our breath away every breath we take. For every breath we have, all of us ever created is given by God. Pure gift, pure grace. This grace, this gift is not free, however. It does not come without a cost. There is a reason why it is so precious, which we so conveniently forget. Because to consider for a minute its value would require us to consider our response. And that, my friends, is where it gets hard. In Reformed theology, which as Presbyterians is our theology, so listen up, <laughs> take notes, <laughs> All of this comes under the heading of justification, being saved, and sanctification, being made holy. Grace is hard at work in both. Reformed theologian Shirley Guthrie explains these doctrines this way. You'll see it on your screen because it's a lot. If I am asked whether I am a Christian, it is not enough for me to answer yes. I am a sinner who believes that nevertheless I am accepted, loved, and forgiven by God through Jesus Christ. Christians are not just people who passively trust God to accept them as they are, solve their problems, meet their personal and family needs, comfort and save them. They are people who respond to God's love, forgiveness, and acceptance with thankful obedience in every area of their lives. To be a Christian is not only to believe and receive, but to live and serve as a Christian. Justification tells us how a person becomes a Christian. Sanctification tells us how a person grows in the Christian life. Justification tells us about God's gracious action toward us. Sanctification tells us about our response with obedient action toward God. Justification tells us that God is for us, forgiving and saving us from sin. Sanctification tells us that by the Holy Spirit, the same God works in us, helping us to leave our sin behind and begin a new and radically different kind of life. Justification faith and sanctification action must be distinguished from each other but they can never be separated. They are two different aspects of the one gracious work of the same God. The two doctrines, justification and sanctification, therefore go together. Otherwise, both doctrines become diluted, even cheapened. In his seminal book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German pastor and theologian, also one of our Reformed heroes, examines the consequences of one without the other, which he calls cheap grace. Grace that doesn't require sacrifice or change as compared to costly grace. Grace that means something. See his words. Cheap grace means forgiveness of sins proclaimed as a general truth. No contrition is required, still less any real desire to be delivered from sin. Cheap grace therefore amounts to a denial of the living word of God. In fact, a denial of the incarnation of the word of God. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Grace alone does everything, they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. 
costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. My friends, cheap grace is merely words. Costly grace is profound action. So what does that mean for us? Well, there are many ways in which we grow as Christians and are sanctified, set apart, made more holy. A good place to start, I find, is through the acts of confession and repentance. When we have sinned, when we have literally missed the mark, we have damaged our relationship with God, we have fractured our relationships with others. We do it all the time. The only way to mend them, the only way to remake the mark is to recognize what we have done or left undone or said or left unsaid, what we have thought or hoped or felt that injured God or part of God's entire creation. And then to confess it, to tell those whom we have harmed, to say we are sorry, to ask for forgiveness, and finally, to repent, to make amends, to modify behaviors, to reshape thoughts, to really mean it, and to really believe that God can and will help us turn ourselves around and restore and make whole our relationships with God's self and with each other. And then to watch as God works towards crafting a new and right spirit within all of us. There is a place in this world where this is ongoing every minute of every day on purpose. An intentional effort to listen, to understand, to allow folks to speak, to share, to unburden themselves. A place where costly grace is alive and at work in an astonishing way. That place is Rwanda, a place that is dear to my heart. I've been there now four times. Every time I go, people share more and more about their lives with me. They also share more and more about the horror they experienced during the genocide that began 26 years ago this April and lasted for 100 days, ending with the loss of one million souls they're still finding bodies. It was a genocide long in the making over many decades of strife and division. Many decades. It is a tragedy that will define and linger in that country for many decades to come, if not forever. The Rwandan people are determined that this never happened to anyone else ever again, and so they share their stories as many times as they need to as many people as will listen. They are determined to tell the truth to others, to one another, to themselves. They are so brave. For Rwandans, this truth became standing firm in the face of blistering heartache and fear, speaking out against the perpetrators, acknowledging their own role, enabling a system that allowed the genocide to happen in the first place. It became enduring decades of continued trauma as perpetrators were repatriated from neighboring countries with many still on the run. It became realizing that with so few people left, Rwanda might not survive. It's the size of Maryland. Who would farm the land and feed the country? In response, an idea emerged within the government allow those imprisoned for genocide crimes to work the land of their victims. 
Each day they would walk out to the fields to farm. At the end of the day, they would walk back to prison. During the season, the produce they grew fed the family of the ones they killed. In the process, the survivors discovered that working alongside one another may heal relationships considered damaged beyond repair. As may living alongside one another again. But only when a perpetrator genuinely admits their wrongdoing to God, themselves, their victims, when a survivor genuinely receives their repentance as authentic every single day. This truth led to action. In the shadow of an international tribunal established by the United Nations to try, convict, jail, and possibly execute perpetrators, trained Rwandan mediators traveled across the country. With the pace of conviction so slow and the need for resolution so great, the intercessors endeavored to facilitate conversations between survivors and perpetrators, often neighbors, many times friends, even relatives, to refashion a relationship to put aside revenge, to consider mercy. To facilitate this, my friend, Pastor Deo Gashagaza, the executive director of Prison Fellowship Rwanda, established reconciliation villages, communities where perpetrators and survivors live side by side, where visitors are invited to come and hear their stories, where grace roams wild. The people there are used to welcoming strangers. They tell us that they feel called to relate their story so that those with ears to hear may understand how quickly lies told by people in positions of authority can lead to anger and division and hate and eventually murder. How easy it is to be persuaded to do something so unforgivable. They tell us they feel called to share their experiences with all who enter their village so that those with eyes to see may recognize the cleansing humility of confession, the redeeming reversal of forgiveness, the transformative power of mercy, the restorative harmony of community. I was able to witness this in all its glory during my first visit to one of these villages. As we sat in a circle, perpetrator next to survivor, next to perpetrator, I noticed a young man and woman seated side by side, the man holding a baby. When it was his turn to speak, he stood, handed the baby to the woman next to him and said, I did wrong. I killed people. I can't look at his face. This is how I did it. This is why. This is how many years I served in prison. Twelve. This is how I've been restored. I cry every time I talk about Rwanda. They have forgiven me. This is how I have become human again. They have allowed me to live in this place. When the man returned to his seat, the woman stood, handed her baby to the man who had confessed once more. And pointing to the man, she declared to all of us, gathered around, that man holding my baby, he is the one who killed my loved ones. But I have forgiven him. Now I live as neighbors. My friends, that is called restorative justice. It is called reconciliation, and it is called grace. And it is this costly grace, the justice taken on by Jesus as he hung from the cross, which restores us all, one to another and all of us to God. So today I ask you, in this church and in this community, 
in our country, in our world, where division is becoming quite the sport, what is your response? Will you merely accept your salvation, or will you live as if your life, all of our lives, Jesus' life, depends upon it? For being saved through faith is God's gift to us by God's grace, and so is living like it. Thanks be to God in all things. Amen.